Welcome to Tree ID 101, brought to you by Crawfordsville District Public Library. My name is Stephanie Morissette, and I will be your presenter on today's topic. Today's topic, Tree ID 101, will focus on warm weather tree identification, and then Tree ID 102, which will be brought to you later this fall, will focus on winter weather tree ID. So without further, uh, further pause, let's go ahead and get on to my favorite topic, trees. So why trees? Uh, ever since I've been young, I've always had an affinity for trees. I grew up on a farm and so I had access to a lot of green space and therefore a lot of trees. So when people ask me, why do you like trees so much? Ha ha ha. I just want to respond with, I'm so glad you asked. And down there you'll see an audio clip in this little meme for one hour, 52 minutes and 33 seconds. Uh, I promise you uh, this program will not take quite as long but there is a lot of information that I would like to share with you on uh, some beginner Tree ID 101. Then and now, trees have always been an important, an important part of my life. Um, I've studied trees since I was young, uh, all the way up into adulthood and through college and on into my career experience. So I've literally brought it from childhood into adulthood and incorporated trees into every part of my life. And as a result, this has, Nick, this has honored me with the nickname of Tree Hugger, which I actually take literally. We, we all remember at least one friend from childhood who had an amazing treehouse fort. And this always brings back such nostalgic memories for me, uh, again, because we're, related to, we're relating to trees. Trees bring us so many benefits from the oxygen that we breathe in our air um, to uh, act as a carbon sink for uh, sequestering, um, to help with stormwater runoff, to help secure uh, soil in place to keep from erosion. Um, there are just so many benefits. And then also there's always climbing trees. And trees still bring us so much more. The books that we love from childhood to adulthood, just they're also made from trees. So not only do we cherish trees for all the things we've already mentioned, but for the things that they continue to bring us and treasures that will last forever. And then we have family trees. On a funny note here, one summer session, I was running late for one of my tree classes, of course, and two young ladies were walking towards me as I was literally running past them. And one of them shouted, run Forrest, run. And I almost tripped over my own feet for laughing so hard. Uh, and it also brings back fond memories of my favorite movie, Forrest Gump. Trees have been in the fossil record for millions of years. Around 385 million years ago, according to the geologic time scale. So that would have been in the mid-Devonian period and around the Paleozoic era. So for a long, long time, trees have been around and the first trees uh, that begin to appear were called pro-gymnosperms. Pro meaning before, and then gymnosperm is an extinct classification of trees. So here in a few minutes, we're going to talk about the two main divisions of trees as we know them today, and those would be the angiosperms and the gymnosperms. So these earliest trees, or these pro-gymnosperms, they actually reproduced by spores, very similar to uh, a fungus, rather than seeds. And this is due to the fact that spores germinate and grow very quickly, uh, much quicker than a seed does. It takes a much longer period of time to begin to grow. Um, so these trees that were able to grow up and out very quickly were able to diversify. So because they're fast growing, they tended to start around wetland and coastal areas and then sort of creep inward on land. So these forests were able to develop and diversify in their complexity over time. So they went from being fern-like trees uh, to more trees that we're familiar with today, not quite as fern-like because they're not quite that tall and definitely distinctly different and now almost extinct, save for one tree. And that tree would be the ginkgo biloba tree or the dinosaur tree, also known as the maidenhair tree, which the ginkgo is technically a conifer, believe it or not, and it's the only one, the only living species left in its division of pro-gymnosperms as all the others are extinct. So 
up in the upper left-hand image, you can see an imprint of a ginkgo leaf in a fossil. Um, so the ginkgo trees appeared approximately 270 million years ago um, is when they can date these fossils back to. Um, and on the previous slide, I did say 385 million years ago that the earliest trees began to show in the fossil record. This is true. And I have said 270 million years ago for the fossils that the ginkgo found. This is also true. In that sense, the geologic time scale almost works backwards. So the lower their number goes, so from 385 million to 270 million is actually closer in time, if you will, to where we are today on the geologic scale. Uh, male ginkgo trees have a very high allergy rating, a 7 out of 10 on the opal's allergy scale, uh, so they can kind of aggravate people who have uh, sinus issues. Um, and there's a distinct difference between the male and ginkgo, uh, the male and female ginkgo tree, which we'll discuss here in a second. Male and female ginkgo trees actually display their own distinct sexes. The male trees actually bear what are considered technically small cones, and they release the pollen. If you look in the upper left-hand image, that is an image of a male ginkgo tree in the small little cones that uh, come off the stem around the leaves there. Uh, the female trees, they have small rounded ovules where the, the pollination and fertilization occurs, and then the fruit later forms. The lower left-hand image are the small ovules on the, little, on the little stems of the female ginkgo tree at the end of the twigs. And then the right image is the, ripe, the ripening fruit. The very interesting thing about the ginkgo tree is, it, and some other trees can do this too, but the ginkgo can switch sexes. And by that, uh, males can actually change individual branches on those trees, their trees, uh, to switch to females and then they can still be able to provide pollen to other female ginkgos. So when the pollen is released onto individual female branches on the male ginkgo tree, they not only can self-fertilize, but they can also continue to fertilize any uh, female ginkgos in the area. So self-fertilization of the male ginkgo tree is sort of an extinction prevention thing. Um, whereas when females, female trees, produce male pollen cones even on one branch. This actually reduces the genetic diversity of the ginkgo. And by this, it means that technically one male branch on a female tree has enough pollen to fertilize the entire tree, if that gives you any idea of how much pollen a, a male cone actually uh, has. Um, the ginkgo tree is also known as a leaky tree in horticultural terms because of their ability to kind of leak over into one or the other or both sexes. The ginkgo fruit is edible, uh, but I'm personally deterred from it in, in just probably the sense that the first time I ever smelled the fruit of the ginkgo as it was ripening and falling off the tree, I did not realize it was the ginkgo tree that, that the fruit was actually exuding that pungent, uh, foul-smelling, sulfury odor very reminiscent of rotten eggs. So I've kind of shied away from uh, trying the ginkgo, and perhaps I'm a little bit jaded for that. Uh, it is edible in small quantities. As we know, anything in excess is not necessarily good, but apparently it tastes similar to a plum, uh, the fleshy part of the fruit does, and then once shelled and roasted, have a nutty, uh, a, a nutty flavor similar to a chestnut, however much softer than a chestnut. Early on, I alluded to the two main divisions of trees as we know them uh, that we would be discussing after the progymnosperms. Uh, those two classes include the angiosperms and the gymnosperms. Now, angiosperms are simply our flowering plants uh, and then also our deciduous trees. And deciduous trees are simply those trees that lose their leaves every year and then grow new ones back. Deciduous trees and flowering plants have seeds that are covered by an outer covering or an outer coating of some sort. So this could be anything from our fruits to our nuts and sort of encompasses a lot of different uh, types of structures that protect those seeds. Gymnosperms, the other class, focuses on the conifers and the evergreens. So those uh, Christmas trees, if you will, that stay green all year round with their needles. Now, conifers, as we know, produce cones. 
cones contain seeds which are determined uh, in botanical terms are considered naked. Uh, by that, it means that once a cone begins to open up, these tiny little seeds sort of shake out from the inside and disperse. They have a little wing on them, so the topper, uh, excuse me, the upper portion of the little seed. If you look in the upper image for the gymnosperm seeds, there's almost a little wing on the top of it that helps it once it falls out of the cone to flutter and disperse a little farther from the parent plant. There are two exceptions to being one or the other as opposed to a gymnosperm or angiosperm. Those two exceptions fall into both classes of angiosperm and gymnosperms. Those two trees include the bald cypress and the uh, tamarack tree that is uh, it's also known as the larch. So these are technically deciduous evergreens. Those two deciduous evergreens, again, are the bald cypress and the larch, AKA the tamarack. On the left-hand side, you see Taxodium distictum, which is the bald cypress. So it is native to Southern Indiana over near where the Wabash and Ohio River uh, confluge together. And as you can see in the lower left-hand image there, the uh, bald cypress has uh, knees. So if you look to the closest root flare of that giant uh, bald cypress, there's a little stick poking up out of the ground. Those are actually uh, the knees and they help bring in additional air uh, from the roots to the tree. And that gives its ability to grow in wet environments. And the image just adjacent to the left-hand images, you see a round globular green structure. That is actually the cone of the bald cypress. So they'll dry out later in the year. And then once they open, those naked seeds will fall out. And again, this is a deciduous evergreen, meaning that those needles will turn orange and fall off at the end of the year, and it will grow new ones in the spring. On the right-hand side, you see two images. This is the tamarack or the larch. Um, what's interesting about Larix larcinia, larcina, if I said that right, I don't even know on that Latin word, um, that the cones are rather small. They're very small, about the size of a pinky fingernail. And very interesting about the feathery nature of the tamarack needles. They're very fine and very soft, just as the bald cypress. Um, and they're almost what's termed whorled, W-H-O-R-L-E-D. Um, around the branches in little tiny knobs compared to uh, how we think of regular branches and they are structurally on trees. So the branches go around and the needles go around the twigs. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines a tree as a woody perennial plant having a single, usually elongate main stem, generally with few or no branches on its lower part. We know this from early grade school. So this consists of the roots, the trunk, the branches, and the crown. So from bottom to top. Trees every year will grow a ring around, which contributes to the outward girth or the outward uh, diameter of the tree. So as the trunk, as the tree grows up, the rings grow out and more wood is added. In forestry terms, the trunk is considered the bowl interesting about trees, and we won't go too much into this, but there are a lot of different layers. And the most inner portion of a tree is, is solely to provide structural support as that wood is dead. There's also living wood in trees that is towards the outside of the tree or, or closer to the bark. And these rings, as they grow, are alive. And then as they die, they contribute to the heartwood or the structural support of the tree. There are two components uh, that I want to talk about real quickly to kind of give you an idea of the complexity of how trees grow. They have um, two piping networks, if you will, that are called uh, xylem and phloem. And these cells within these layers are solely responsible for moving nutri nutrients and micro elements up the tree or sugars uh, down the tree. So water will go up and then um, sugars produced will come down. The xylem cells are the ones that push everything from the roots to the shoots. And then in the phloem cells, 
are what bring the sugars and flow down to the roots for storage. Um, and then there's a little tiny layer in between the xylem and the phloem called the cambium. And this thin layer is only six to 14 cells wide. That's microscopic. And it's responsible for the production of either xylem cells or phloem cells. So in the cambium layer is where this uh, differentiates. And this contributes again to the tree's overall growth. Um, it was also noted here that we know that bark surrounds all, the, all our, our trees. And in um, early days in early Indiana, when it was being clear cutted for uh, raising crops and whatnot, trees were, were girdled. And if you're unfamiliar with that term, girdled simply means, uh, well, let's think of women when they use girdles and cinch in their waists. Similar in trees, if you girdle them, you're removing a layer of outer bark in a ring entirely around the tree. And if that layer of bark is taken off or cut, even a chainsaw cut, all the way around the tree, you're severing the xylem and phloem's ability to move those, those nutrients and water or sugars up or down. And when that happens, the tree literally chokes to death because it can't, ac it can't access the nutrients it needs in order to grow. So pioneers would do this. They would hatch it around a tree and strip off the bark all the way around. This uh, sped up the process of a tree dying and would allow the wood to dry out somewhat before the following year, those farmers and pioneers could come back and harvest the trees once they were dead. One more tree related term, if you will, is what are called dichotomous keys. Uh, basically, it just means branching. So for instance, in this image, we can say we have plants. Don't make seeds, which be your gymnosperms. Make seeds, which would be pretty much all your deciduous trees. Dendrology is simply the scientific study of trees. So this could be all of these things, taxonomy, identification, silvical characteristics, simply meaning what type of soil conditions they need, ranges, which are the areas in which they grow as far as latitude would be concerned, um, or altitude, uh, morphology or their structures, and then ecology, what it needs in its local environment. Um, trees can do so many different things. We already discussed a few of those benefits. Erosion control, timber, habitat, food, oxygen, and of course, clean air. A little bit further is dendrochronology. Dendrochronology is the study, the scientific study of tree rings. And what these dendrochronologists do are that they study disks. So if we were to look downward on a disk or a section of a tree cookie, if you will, we can learn about historical environmental events that happened. Uh, for instance, if there was a forest fire, um, however many years ago, we can look into this tree literally and see where that burn occurred and the tree continued to grow around it and kind of incorporated that into the wood. We can also learn about um, insect events or uh, perhaps some kind of physical damage to the tree as it grew, uh, a say a nail and the tree continued to grow around that nail and you actually find it in a cut. That's not a good thing if you're um, using a chainsaw. Uh, sometimes you don't know. Um, what else can tree cookies tell us? They can tell us as well in an urban environment, and this is where I did my studies, this was my specialty, um, was taking core samples from trees and what I could learn from studying those core samples as I read the rings on them um, were that trees in urban environments tend to be impacted on one side or more by soil compaction, uh, root restrictions. So the rings on this side of, of the tree cookie will actually be smaller and then on the other side they're wider or larger. And so this side of the tree where the rings are wider and larger, uh, they have better access to aeration or air in the soil, better access to water, and uh, didn't have as many root restrictions. And if cases like this are taken to the extreme in urban environments, you might see a tree that is dead on one side but living everywhere else. This can also be determined from those factors of soil compaction, root restriction, and things of that nature. So tree, tree cookies can tell us a lot. A couple historical slides here, and then we're really gonna get into the, the nitty gritty of tree identification. This just kind of gives you a background on trees. 
Historically, Indiana's forested land was about 85% for the state to, that was forested. Um, and currently, the private, most forested lands are held by private landowners. And it's, it's just really amazing that only 20% of Indiana is currently forested and 87% of that 20% is privately held. The primary forest types that we had either historically or currently in Indiana include um, oak hickory forests, which were a past forest mix in Indiana, as well as currently in Southern Indiana. And then historically in the Northern portion of Indiana were beech and maple trees. And because more land up here was flat and it, it was clear cut as opposed to being hilly, they can't clear cut as much uh, because it's so steep. And currently today, the Northern portion of Indiana's forests that are left are comprised of elm, ash, or cottonwood. In the nation, Indiana is first in the production of office furniture, kitchen cabinets, and especially hardwood veneer, and third overall nationally for hardwood lumber production. So as you can see, the forest, the, the forest products industry is still a large component of Indiana today. And forest products is the sixth largest manufacturing industry in Indiana, so that's behind dairy and popcorn and then ninth nationally in total lumber production. So that would include your hardwoods and your softwoods. So these um, statistics and information are brought to you by the Indiana Department of Natural Resources, Division of Forestry, and those uh, statistics and numbers are current as of this year. The predominantly historical trees of Indiana that were significant as far as their usage was concerned include oak, maple, walnut, locust, sycamore, uh, black cherry, and of course the tulip tree, or the uh, yellow poplar, AKA Indiana state tree. Now oak, as we know, is a very dense, strong wood. It's rather slow growing for the most part. So a lot of items were made from oak, furniture, barns, houses, lots of different things. Maple trees, uh, is all, maple trees, a lot of them are hardwoods, not all of them. But maple trees were tapped for uh, the sugar water, which could then be boiled down into syrup and candy and then made into candies. Walnut trees, walnut trees are probably the most valuable timber in Indiana. In Indiana. Uh, it has a very rich chocolate color. And we're, that, these are trees that we're going to identify. Uh, several of the tre these trees we will use in our identifications. Uh, black locust trees were... a uh, probably the number one tree species used for uh, wooden fence posts in historical times because they were age and rot resistant. So you could probably submerge a, a locust log in water and it would take a very long time to decompose. Sycamore trees were used, um, their wood was used as well. I'm sure they used most of the timber they could find here. Uh, sycamore trees can mark water courses. We'll learn to identify this tree. Black cherry trees were used uh, not only prized for the beautiful reddish wood, but could also derive cough syrups from the black cherry. However, had to be careful because cough syrup from the black cherry tree actually contains a cyanide. That's what makes your throat feel numb. Uh, like if you use um, some, some throat numbing sprays, there's just a little bit in there. So um, sometimes this could cause problems for pioneers if there was too much given in a dosage. Uh, and finally, we have our tulip tree. The tulip trees grow so fast, so straight, and so tall, and they're flexible enough that they're easily formed, uh, and it's the most dominant, predominant tree in Indiana. Tulip trees, uh, because they grew so fast and so tall, and they were flexible enough that pioneers could use steam, they could shape the wood to meet the form of the need. Here's the sugar maple. Sugar maples were tapped for the, the syrup, or excuse me, the sugar water that could be boiled down into maple syrup. Um, trees can hold up to three to four taps at the most. I would say no more than three. Um, this decreases the injury of the hole in which you make to insert the tap. Uh, so trees can actually heal from small wounds and grow around them, sort of like we would form first a scab and then a scar. Uh, so each year pioneers would move the taps not to, to a different location on the tree rather than use the same old injury or area to prevent further injury to the tree. Um, 
what else can I do? Oh yes, very interesting. So pioneers would take this, uh, this sugar water and boil it down and it takes, and I know this from experience because I too have tapped trees and made syrup that, um, it takes 40 gallons of sugar water from a maple tree to equal one gallon of maple syrup. We discussed briefly, briefly the tulip tree. The tulip tree, because it, it, it is so uh, it easily formed, these historical images are right here from Montgomery County. We have the Darlington Covered Bridge, and then we also have the Yountsville Covered Bridge. These were single span wooden bridges, and by that I mean, if you look at the lower image, you see those arching spans that kind of arch and curve over on the bridge. Those boards, those spans come from tulip trees because again, they grow fast, they grow straight, and they grow tall. So they could form that wood using steam to make the arches for single span wooden bridges. The map on the right hand side is from, there we go, 1967. And surrounding the, surrounding the state's uh, image, you can see there are different examples of covered bridges throughout the state. And then the dots on the actual map itself are locations of those covered bridges throughout Indiana. And as we know, the covered bridge festivals are a huge deal here. Uh, so historically they've been celebrated and again, they're still celebrated today. Root systems, roots can go down or out or sometimes a combination of both. The roots provide the uh, anchoring or the stability to the tree to keep it upright above ground. The roots absorb water and micronutrients and minerals and using the xylem cells, they move those uh, nutrients and water up the tree and then the phloem brings them down the roots for storage. Uh, root systems can be deep or down as in your oaks, your hickories and even your cypresses. Root systems can also be shallow, by that I mean they spread out um, and a lot of conifers are this way. So sometimes you'll see after big storms, deciduous trees will tend to snap at the bowl or somewhere along the trunk. Uh, whereas conifers, when they get knocked over, they usually come up by the whole root system. Uh, roots generally occupy two to four times the diameter of the crown. So if we look at the crown, we can think of, to get an idea of, of where roots start and then how far they go out, we can think of the tree as having a drip line. And by that, if you were to go out on either side of the tree and look up to where the farthest branches come out and then go straight down, roots go out at least that far and two to four times more than that. So incredibly, incredibly complex network of structural stability. And here it comes, let's get ready to take some notes because we're getting into it. There are two different types of branching patterns for deciduous trees in our areas and simply in this division of angiosperms. And those two types of branching patterns are opposite and alternate. Looking at these two twigs here, the opposite uh, branching pattern is noted in the above portion of the image. And you can see that there are buds on opposite sides of the twig. Then we have the alternate branch or twig on the lower image. And again, you can see that those buds alternate up the twig. So these, this right here is, is what I use as the number one easiest way to begin tree identification, uh, especially when there are no leaves on the tree. So this is exceptionally important when you're doing winter weather tree ID. Uh, most trees, deciduous trees, exhibit an alternate branching or bud pattern. And there are only a few that uh, that are native here that that uh, have the opposite type branching. So let's discuss those. There's an acronym, an acronym that I use called Mad Buck, and that simply stands for those tree species that display opposite branching. Mad being uh, maple, ash, and dogwood, so M-A-D, and then buck for the buckeye trees. So these four species right here, mad buck, maple ash, dogwood, buckeye, are the four tree species here in Indiana that we have that display opposite branching. I'm saying trees, okay, so deciduous trees. So we're gonna talk about the maples, the ashes, and uh, we really won't go into dogwoods, and then we'll discuss the buckeyes. But these, these four trees uh, 
are key in separating your opposite to alternating branch trees. And as I said, again, you will begin by, for identification, looking at does it have opposite buds or leaves or branches as opposed to alternate. There are so many ways to identify trees uh, besides opposite versus alternate branching. Um, really probably the, the number one way most people identify trees um, when they study them is their leaves. Um, I tend to think again that the looking at the branching helps, especially if I'm not sure if it's a cultivar or a subspecies of say oaks um, or red oaks. Um, so we also have leaf shape, which is very helpful. The margin of the leaves or the way the lobes are shaped or uh, the edges as far as are they serrated, are they toothed, are they entire, are they rounded. Um, the venation or the way that the, the central lines run through the leaf. This is a distinction in the dogwood trees. They tend to have parallel venation or you have your central leader that goes down the center of the leaf and then the little veins that come off of that are parallel to one another. And that's a good key characteristic for identifying dogwoods. Uh, buckeyes also have a distinct shape, um, as do maples. So there are a lot of different combinations that you can use. And it's particularly helpful when you further break down your tree, uh, your tree species to say you have oak and then break it down to red oaks and white oaks and then further on down to uh, subspecies in those uh, different classes. And also the arrangement of the leaf on the tree, alternate or opposite. Bark characteristics are easy to use, particularly in winter weather tree ID. Uh, the few tree species here that we're going to discuss have distinctive bark characteristics that will be helpful in beginning field tree identification. The first image on the left, Vegas grandifolia or the American beech, is a tree that we discussed as being historically significant as far as. Uh, uh, northern Indiana forested types of the past. It's an extremely slow growing species. So if you see large uh, specimens out in the woods, that generally says they're pretty old. Uh, the bark is very smooth, but it's also very thin. So if you visit state parks frequently and you walk on the trails, you can see some large trees that have initials carved into them. And sometimes the whole tree is scarred with initials. These are always beech trees. And beech trees, because the bark is so thin, they cannot recuperate uh, from all that scarification. And so they uh, cannot heal the wounds. And that's why you continue to see all the initials carved even over time. And it's no longer fresh. You can still read the, the uh, words on the tree. Um, so yeah, this, is, this injures the tree. But this, the bark of the beech tree is extremely smooth. And it sort of has the appearance of an elephant hide. And it's light ashen gray. The second tree is Platinus occidentalis, or the American sycamore. You can see that it has a characteristic bark there of being white underneath, and then it sloughs off the camouflage flaky bark. And the sycamore trees grow all along Sugar Creek. So you can easily walk outside and probably spot one very quickly. If you were out in, say, uh, wilderness Indiana back in the day, and you didn't have any more fresh water and you weren't sure where to access that, if you were able to find a low area and then start combing for the bark of the sycamore tree and you see that distinct white, if you go towards it, you will eventually find a water source. The next tree we're gonna discuss is Celtis occidentalis or the hackberry. This tree's bark is really warty and corky um, and it's, extremely unusual as in the differing ages of these specimens their bark can look different so it can be confusing sometimes if you have a younger specimen versus an older specimen so it really has a, a warty w-a-r-t-y or corky appearance to the bark caria ovata or the shag bark hickory we've probably all seen these trees and now you can look at them confidently and say that's a shag bark hickory and they're a hardwood species that's, in, that's been important both in the past and in the present here in Indiana. And then finally, uh, fruit trees have a characteristic bark too of having little uh, 
horizontal lenticels or breathing pores along the bark. This is Prunus serotina or the black cherry, which is native to Indiana forests. Buds are important too uh, for identifying trees. Uh, buds can be scaled, have overlapping little shingles, if you will, to cover them. They can be naked, um, even as deciduous trees, as far as they don't have any covering, they just have a, a, a leafy a leafy sheath over the bud itself. They can be sticky, as in your buckeyes or your horse chestnuts. They can be fuzzy, like your pussy willows, powdery, like, let's look at the upper images on the right. The bitternut hickory, or Caria cordiformis, it has uh, not only pointy and feathery type buds, but they're also powdery. So if we were to touch them, the little bit of powder would would uh, come off on our fingers. Buds can also be rounded, similar to, um, there's down on the bottom row, let's say sycamore, um, a, lot of different, a lot of different shaped buds. They can also be different colors, and uh, pointy is another one. So let's look here quickly, the top row, three images over the beech bud. Not only is it scaled, but it's very pointed. Uh, this would be, Another way to identify the beach, if you were in the woods, not only by the gray, ashen, elephant hide bark, smooth bark, but the pointy scaled buds. Getting a little bit deeper, and we're just going to touch on this, are two other characteristics you can use to identify certain species of trees. This includes your leaf scars and bundle sheath scars. So in this image here, we look at we see the buds, see them there, the different shapes of the buds. There's the sycamore bud on the bottom image that's naked. Um, and you just see how the buds are kind of perched on these weird shaped looking areas. The weird shaped areas, like let's look at the pawpaw there. It looks like a big smile. That is actually where the petiole of the leaf attached to the twig. So that would be the leaf scar. So when the leaves fall off, it leaves a little scar and tucked inside there is the bud already in place for the next year. Again, let's keep looking at that pawpaw image down there of the leaf scar. You notice there are five little dots on the inside. Those little black circles would be the bundle sheath scars. And those bundle sheaths are where the leaf, the petiole was attached. Those were the, the, the piping networks that moved um, those sugars and those waters and everything up and down. And so when the leaves fall off at the end of the year, we can see the bud already in place. We can also see the leaf scar and we can see the bundle sheath scars and that can help differentiate between species. For instance, our green and white ashes. You can use the leaf scar to identify those different species, subspecies. Flowers, fruits, and nuts. These are uh, items we use every day that we may overlook that help us identify trees. So our apples, our oranges, our walnuts, our pecans. And then in the springtime, we even have our magnolias, which we can say, oh, that's a magnolia. They're so beautiful and they smell so wonderful. But I want to focus quickly on this top image, the left-hand image. And that white flower is from a dogwood tree. We can see the leaves in the background. And I described the venation, the parallel venation of the leaves. You can see that it's a little blurry in the background image, but those, like I said, is are a characteristic of dogwoods. Also, the veins that run through the petals of the flower display or exhibit that parallel veination. Continuing with fruits, nuts, and berries, we have different shaped seeds that are uh, covered. So our angiosperm seeds here, we have bladder-like bracts, we have acorns, we have samaras, maples have samaras. Those are helicopters that we see every year falling off our trees and fluttering everywhere. Uh, elms and ashes also have a modified type Samara or a winged seed. We have berries, we have uh, conglobular seeds, sort of uh, like mulberry seeds or sycamore balls up there in the right hand corner. There are our nuts, which are enclosed in husks. We have seeds enclosed in prickly balls. They're like fleshy balls with prickles. We have pods like the red bud. We have droops like the cherries. Um, spurs, spiny spurs like your sweet gums. And then down here we have our, our uh, gymnosperms, our cones, including the globular bald cypress cone and then our typical pine cone with its winged seeds.
The first tree species or family that we're going to focus on is the Quercus family or the oak family. There are two divisions in the oak family. There are the white oaks and then there are the red oaks. White oaks include your white oak, your bur oak, uh, swamp white oaks, and then in your red oak side of the family you have your red oak, black oak, pin oak, schumard, scarlet, the list goes on and on, but we'll focus on just talking about a few is a few of these examples and how to tell them apart. The number one way when you're looking at leaves to identify uh, trees uh, is that you can separate quickly the red oaks from the white oaks. White oaks have rounded uh, sinuses or lobes, whereas the red oaks have uh, pointy leaf tips. Quercus alba or the white oak, which has the rounded leaf tips characteristics and these some of these characteristics are just generic characteristics for oaks overall um, other than the white oak family and the white oak in particular has those rounded lobes so you can see that leaf example up in the upper right hand corner and then underneath that the acorn shape and color further on down the rounded but clustered buds at the terminal end of the twig the image next to that you can see what are called lateral buds coming off of some petioles that are still on the tree. And then up above that image are what are called catkins, and those are the male reproductive flowers on the oak tree. Quercus bicolor, swamp white oak, has those rounded lobes to distinguish it in the white oak family. You can see in that upper left-hand image, the leaves are very glossy. The sinuses are not very deep, so uh, the, the lobes appear shallow. They're very glossy dark green. This image appears the leaves look a little lighter shade. There is individual variation in trees, uh, but they, the, the swamp white oak tends to be a little darker glossy on the top. The underside image is pale in comparison to the top, and they're somewhat fuzzy as there are white hairs on the undersides of the leaves. Generally speaking, if you don't quickly identify a swamp white oak based on the leaf shape, you can turn the leaf over and using a hand lens or a magnifying glass, you can look, you can examine it to look for those white hairs. Um, so again, the rounded lobes to put it in the white oak family. The upper right image, you can see the acorns are definitely smaller than the white oak. The swamp white oak, as you might think, grows in, can grow in wetter areas. However, it cannot be submerged uh, like the roots of the bald cypress. Swamp white oaks are a good urban an urban tree, meaning they're tolerant to drought and some soil compaction, um, and they just tend to do well better than some other oaks in urban areas. Quercus macrocarpa, or the bur oak, again is in the white family. If we look at the, the right image of the leaf, we can see that it does distinctly have the rounded tips, and it has a cinched in waist or uh, sinuses, if you will, for the, the leaf there. Um, the leaf base is narrower and the upper portion of the leaf is wider. And this tree likes wetter areas, this particular oak. It can have very large bushy acorns, as you can see in the bottom two images. The acorns themselves are probably, oh, a big, about as big around as a half dollar perhaps, um, and the hairy characteristics on the ends of the cap itself. So the acorn itself is almost entirely contained within the acorn cap. Then another distinguishing characteristics are the winged stems and branches of the bur oak. So this corky bark on these larger twigs and branches of the bur oak help in factoring into identification. It too can survive in wetter areas. Quercus muhlenbergii, or the chinka pin oak, is in the white oak family. The leaves are rather coarse uh, and toothed, so at the tips there's little like bristles. Uh, well, excuse me, no bristles, but they're still tipped. Yet if you look at the lower image of the leaf on the right hand side, they're still rather wavy, so they're not as pointed as you will be able to definitely tell with the red oaks. These leaves are on the cheek pin oak are dark green. They're really kind of tough and leathery feeling, but they're really smooth as well. Uh, they have a pale underside. Um, their acorns are a lot darker brown than uh, some of the other oaks, um, and they have tiny little short stalks on their acorn caps. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
The branches tend to be rather large and low or drooping on some of your more mature specimens, and this oak in particular has a deep tap root. Moving on into the red oak family, Quercus rubra is actually the red oak. So here are a few of the species in the red oak family that we'll discuss. The red oak, the black oak, the pin oak, and the scarlet oak. Quercus rubra, the northern red oak, has shiny, glossy, gr dark green leaves with bristled tips on the ends of the leaves. The sinuses uh, are rather deep. The buds on the red oak are pointed and, and red, as you can see in the lower image. They also have scales on them. The bark on some of these more old, the older or more mature specimens seem to have um, wide, flat-topped, almost silvery in appearance ridges, and then shallow furls. Uh, the acorn caps on the red oak are a little more dense. The, the little uh, shingles, if you will, that overlap on the acorn cap are tightly packed. Quercus volutna, or the black oak, has similar leaves to the red oak that we just saw. Uh, the leaves are somewhat larger on the black oak than the red oak, and the leaves of the black oak are much shinier and a deeper glossy green. They do have bristle tips and rather deep sinuses. And if you're unsure if you're looking at the red oak or the black oak, you can turn the leaf over and look at the veins on the underside of the leaf. If you look at the two images that in the central column that have the blue arrows on them, you can see close up there's a reddish or rust colored pubescence along those veins. And the acorns of the black oak are about the size of a dime and they're dark brown. And the lower left hand image, you can see the clustered buds at the terminal end of the twig. They are scaled. They also have a white pubescence on them, and that pubescence is evident in the base of the petioles and the top of the twig next to the buds. The last two red oaks that we're going to talk about here briefly are the scarlet oak and the pin oak. Quercus coxiana, or the scarlet oak, uh, and then Quercus palustris, or the pin oak, have, to me, characteristics that I have to inspect a little closer in order for me to differentiate the two of these, unless they're in a similar side-by-side -side comparison as we see here. So for the scarlet oak, the characteristics of the leaf, as we know for the red oaks, they have the bristle or pointed tipped leaves. They're deeply sinuses. You can see where those curvatures in towards the center of the petiole and the veins are. Um, and those sinuses are uh, more or less C-shaped between the lobes. Um, these, the scarlet oak tends to retain its brown leaves throughout the winter, uh, but it's known for its bright fall color, hence the scarlet oak. And for an oak, it has pretty thin bark. In the um, images on the left there, you see the, the leaf. It's skinnier, if you will, than the overall black oak or red oak leaf. The lower image, the acorns are again about the size of a dime, but they don't have they're, they're lighter in color than your black oak or the pin oak, which we're gonna talk right now about. <clears throat> so the pin oak, it has shiny green leaves and almost they almost appear world or uh, around a central axis towards the end of the branches. And the pin oak tends to hold on to its lower branches uh, as it grows. And so those lower branches may be dead and drooping and sort of sweep downward. Um, when the branches do break off of the lower tree, they leave pin-like stubs, and this hence has led to the name pin oaks. Pioneers used to take these uh, pins, if you will, out or off of pin oak trees and use them as um, um, coat hooks or different hooks used in barns and things of that nature. They had the durability of oak for the strength and uh, long life of the wood. Um, the pin oak actually can take many, many years before it starts to um, fruit, even though it's a nut tree, it's still expressing uh, a nut, a reproductive structure. It can take anywhere from 15 to 20 years before bearing acorns. And these acorns as well are rather small, about the size of a dime, but they're dark in color and they have characteristic vertical lines on the acorn itself. Acer species or the maple family, 
this is probably the friendliest family, if you will, uh, to identify followed by your oak trees. So the different species we're gonna talk about here, just some of these, not all of them. Uh, the sugar maple, silver maple, box elder, or also known as the ash leaf maple. We also have red maples, Norway maples, and then those beautiful Japanese maples. Remember when we discussed mad buck or opposite branching trees, Acer sacarum or the sugar maple, as all maples have opposite branching. So this is extremely important for winter weather tree identification because as you, there's no leaves. So we have to then rely on the branches to determine that category of trees if we can. Is it opposite or alternate branching? So we can narrow it down that quickly and then further narrow it down in identification. So the sugar maple has opposite branching. It has a, what's called an entire leaf. So there's no individual leaves or leaflets on them. It has five lobes with shallow sinuses. So you can see that upper image. We are very familiar with this beautiful, beautiful tree. Um, and it has the double-winged Samara or those helicopters that you see in the lower image and the beautiful fall color. Acer saccharinum or the silver maple, uh, the characteristics it has that it shares with um, the sugar maple is opposite branching. It too has entire leaves uh, that are also pointed. Um, and looking at the leaf itself, the sinuses are much deeper, giving it a shallower appearance to the leaf or a skinnier appearance to the silver maple leaf. When you compare that to the sugar maple we just looked at, the leaf was much wider uh, because the sinuses were shallower, so it made it look wider or fatter, whereas the silver maple appears skinnier. On the underside of the silver maple leaf, there is a white, uh, excuse me, a light whitish, grayish, greenish almost underside. Um, it also has the Samara, just like the sugar maple or the little helicopters. An interesting note too on the silver maple is sometimes you can tell when it's going to rain because the undersides of leaves will turn upwards. Um, and displaying the undersides, you see the lighter color. And I sometimes use that to determine if we're gonna have weather come in. And typically we have some type of storm activity happen when predominantly all the leaves of silver maples are turning under over or over under. Uh, the silver maple was mass planted in the 1950s as a monoculture to help re-green cities after Dutch elm disease destroyed the American elm population during the 1930s. So the silver maples were mass planted because one, they were extremely urban tolerant, so they could withstand pollution, soil compaction, uh, stormwater runoff, um, as well as provide the stability for soil and stormwater runoff and, and things of that nature. They had a lot more benefits to re-greening cities. Um, they have a rough shaggy bark and because they grow fast uh, and die fast, they tend to shed a lot of branches and bark and twigs. So messy maple because there's a lot of yard work you have to do when you have these. Many of you would be able to identify these going out on the street today, planted along streets, particularly our very large silver maples. These trees, though they are rather large, are nearing the end of their lifespan because the mac the 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 rough average of maximum silver maple age is typically between, I'd say, 60 to 100 years, maybe. So 60 to 80 would probably be a good average. Um, so they're nearing the end of their lifespans now. So it's best to plant a diversified uh, number of trees if you're going to try to regreen. You don't want to try to plant a monoculture because they're more susceptible to pest or disease blights. Acer nagundo, or the box elder, also known as the ash leaf maple, gets its name because the ash leaf maple um, looks very similar to the, the ashes that we will discuss here in a few minutes. The number one characteristic is the opposite branching of Acer nagundo, or the box elder, as the other maples we have seen. It has a compound leaf, which means that it's composed of individual leaflets on one petiole. So the box elder has three to seven leaflets. Now, this tree, I've heard it referred to as, oh, that's a poison ivy tree. Uh, it gets that nickname because of the appearance of the three terminal leaflets that appear similar to the poison ivy leaves of three. 
the box elder has reddish bluish stems. As you can see in the lower image, the buds are opposite and clustered at the end. They're scaled and somewhat globular in appearance. Uh, the twigs are also opposite branching, just like the buds. It has a winged Samara, just like our other maples or those little helicopters. Um, it's kind of considered a weedy tree um, in the sense that it, just because it reproduces so much and it, it, it's able to pretty much grow just about anywhere, um, it can be rather a nuisance. Uh, if you look at the, in, the central images in the right hand column, that older specimen to the left has nodules of branches coming out anywhere indiscriminately all around it, uh, which is a characteristic of box elders. And then the younger stem or the younger bowl to the right of that image has little round lenticels on very green colored bark. The round lenticels or breathing pores are distinctly different from the black cherry tree lenticels, the horizontal lenticels on the bark that we saw from the black cherry earlier on. Fraxinus species or our ashes, the two that we will be discussing today are the white ash and the green ash. Uh, both the ashes, the white and the green ash, are affected by emerald ash borer, which is an insect that has no natural known predators in the United States and is currently wiping out the um, ash population here throughout Indiana and is spreading across the United States. Um, sometimes arborists will be called out to homeowners and they will be asked, why is my, my tree in decline? Why is my ash looking like it's dying? Um, and the, usually by the time you can tell that it appears your tree is dying, it's already dead. And by that, it's that when the adult insect or the adult EAB uh, lays its eggs under the outer bark of a tree, when the larvae hatch, they eat that inside layer or the cambium and the phloem cells that uh, we discussed early on. And what that does essentially is girdle the tree from the inside out. And so by the time you see your tree in decline, it's usually already dead, just like the girdling the pioneers used to do on the, out, on the outer bark. Uh, so once you see the exit wound evidence on the trunk of the tree from the bark, then typically it's too late to save your, to, to save your ash trees um, unless you really want to invest a lot of time and money in that, which then it's even not guaranteed to be successful at sur, um, surviving the emerald ash borer. Uh, the green ash and the white ash, the white ash being Fraxinus americana and then Fraxinus pennsylvanica being the green ash. If we look at the two leaf comparisons for those subspecies there, the uh, white ash on the top and the green ash on the bottom, uh, those compound leaves will look extremely similar un unless you're upon closer inspection. Then you can see that the white ash has a little bit of a rougher leaf margin compared to a smoother margin on the green ash. So this here is an important characteristic to look for when trying to differentiate between your white ash and your green ash. Praxinus americana, white ash. Characteristics for the white ash include it has opposite branching and compound leaves. Remember, compound leaves are composed of leaflets. The leaflets themselves are rounded uh, compared to the green ash, which we'll see here in a minute. Um, the underside of the white ash leaves tend to be whitish in color uh, with, with the smoother margins. If we look at the central images there, the upper image of the twig, we see there are lenticels there, breathing pores in the wood as well. And then a crescent moon or C-shaped bud scar, or excuse me, um, leaf scar, and then tucked inside that leaf scar, we see the bud ready for the next year. We can also, upon closer inspection, see the row or the, the, the row of uh, bundle sheath scars, those little row of rounded dots. The white ash has a single winged Samara that's a modification of the maple Samara. And ashes can have a yellow fall color, even a reddish to purple fall color, depending on if it's a, a cultivar of the white ash. The older specimens of ash of white ash and green ash for that matter have a sinewy sort of fishnet appearance to the bark. So it has raised ridges and uh, 
deep crevices that appear fish like uh, fish scale, excuse me, fishnet in appearance. Braxinus pennsylvanica or the green ash, it too is opposite branching with compound leaves. It has anywhere between five to nine glossy green leaflets where the white ash I forgot to mention has around seven uh, leaflets on a compound leaf. The green ash has a, a glossier green foliage, foliage, however you say foliage, I've heard it pronounced three different ways. Uh, it has a slightly serrated leaf margin and the leaflets are typically more elliptical in shape than uh, as you saw on the white ash, which had a more rounded leaflets. It too has a modified Samara with a single wing and the older specimens too have that fishnet like appearance. Something important, the two important things I want to mention here is the lower left image, there's a twig. And if we see the, the leaf scar there, we can also see the bundle sheath scars and then perched right above the leaf scar is the bud. This is different than the white ash. White ash is that bug, that bud hugged right down into the crescent moon, whereas the green ash, the bud sits right on top on a flat surface. Glossy top, shiny, uh, serrated leaf margins just ever so slightly, lighter colored on the underside, and then distinctly to tell the two, the two uh, green ash and white ash apart, the leaf scar and the position of the bud would be used for identification. This is important for winter tree ID too. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison of the ash leaf, uh, ash leaf scars. On the left, you see the green ash, and then on the right, the white ash. Let's compare those uh, leaf scars from the green ash to the white ash. So as you can see again on this closer image of the green ash bud, it's perched right across the top of what the, the top of a flatter surface of the green ash leaf scar compared to the white ash on the right hand side where that bud just hugs right down inside the crescent moon. So white ash, the buds inside the leaf scar, the green ash, it's above the leaf scar. Juglans nigra or the black walnut. Characteristics of the black walnut, uh, it has, this tree is alternate. Okay, so that's most important. This is an alternate branching tree. The black walnut tree's characteristics uh, for identification, it has a compound leaf. It has about 18 leaflets typically, but it has no terminal leaflet. In other words, if you look at the left-hand image of that, in, that compound leaf, there's no terminal one. So you see where the two end at the top, there's no leaflet coming straight out between those two. So that's key in identifying the black walnut compared to the white walnut, which don't hear a whole lot about anymore, but we're just gonna focus on the black walnut because they're easier for us to identify. Uh, the buds are white and they're fuzzy and they are naked and they're a little tiny bit sticky. There's a pubescence along the twigs as well. Uh, the bark is chocolate cinnamony brown, as is the color of the wood. Older trees have thick furrows, very wide, thick furrows. Uh, the nut has a thick green husk on the outside that once it decomposes, you see the brown husks or the brown shell on the inside. Uh, what I like about the walnut tree are, well, many things, but particularly is the happy little um, shape of the leaf scar and then the bundle sheath scars inside. So if you look at the, take a look at the lower right hand image, the bud perched inside the little smiley face of the leaf scar with the bundle sheath scars. I just think it's cute. And additionally, black walnut specimens can be identified by taking a pocket knife. If you're not sure, you can take a pocket knife, say, in the wintertime, and you can uh, slice across a piece of twig and look at the inside of the twig. And the twig itself is what's called, it's termed as having a chambered pith. So different tree species have different types of pith on the inside of the twigs, which help in further identification. So it has a ladder-like appearance on the inside of twigs where that is the chambered pith. 
An interesting characteristic to note about the black walnut trees is that they exude a toxin from their roots that inhibits trees from growing in their area. So within the radius of the walnut tree, from the drip line outward uh, to as far as the roots extend, you will not find typically trees growing under or around a walnut tree. All right, it's getting pretty heavy, so let's let's lighten it up a minute with some dendrologist humor. Little Bertrand couldn't understand why he kept losing playmates. We could easily insert little Stephanie couldn't understand why she kept losing playmates. This example here is a black walnut tree, and you know how you can tell here little Bertrand or I go off on telling it's a black black walnut tree by the pinnately compound leaves and the rough gray bark and that it produces walnuts that are enclosed in a rough green husk. It can also be poisonous to other trees. That's probably the reason I didn't have a lot of tree friends when I was growing up, but the trees were my friends and um, I just share everything I can about trees because they're such a joy to me. The right image is a black walnut tree looking up. Platinus occidentalis or the American sycamore this tree is alternate branching. So it has alternate branching and alternate buds placed along the twigs. It has very large entire leaves, entire meaning there are no leaflets composing the compound leaf. So it's one entire leaf. These trees are known for their black, or excuse me, their brown and white bark. Lower on the tree, it's more speckled like a camouflage, and then the further up the tree you go, more bark sloughs off and you see the beautiful uh, undercoat of white. So the closer it goes towards the crown, the more it's gonna shed and the more white bark will be expressed. The seed balls are rounded and quite packed and dense, and then once they loosen up, those little tufts float away and you have many more sycamores. They're found along waterways or near shallow water tables. Again, you can look to these trees in any time of the year, even in wintertime, and see them all along Sugar Creek. Ashtalus glabra, or the Ohio buckeye. This tree is opposite branching. So we've looked at three different species of our mad bucks opposite branching trees today. We've talked about our maples, we've talked about our ashes, and now we're talking about the buckeyes. So I, I said we'd kind of gloss over dogwoods, and we, we kind of did for now. Um, but the Ohio buckeye has a compound leaf that is palmately compound. So there are five leaflets. So if you think of looking at the palm of your hand, how your five fingers come towards the center of your palm, that's why these leaves are termed palmately compound. The Ohio buckeyes and the yellow buckeyes are the first to leap out in the spring. If you go mushroom hunting in the spring for morels or really any other kind of fungus that might be up at the time, you'll see tiny little uh, green just starting to emerge from small trees. These would most probably be your buckeyes. Um, they have rather large buds and scales. They're not sticky like your horse chestnuts, even though they're related. They have a prickly outer coating that once they're uh, dried, they'll pop open and our famous buckeyes drop out. Buckeyes are a token of good luck. Some people carry them in their pockets for or good luck. Um, it typically has a, a corky or a platy looking bark, similar to what I would say maybe really dry, rough skin or alligator hide in appearance. This tree, as well as the horse chestnuts, are toxic to livestock, and it's just a good thing to keep those uh, two things separate. The flowers over in the right hand lower corner, flower is distinguishing and beautiful. Indiana state tree, the tulip tree, Liriodendron tulipifera, is actually in the magnolia family. And there's a lot of different reasons for, for it being classified with, uh, within the magnolia family. Uh, without going further into that, we're all familiar with the leaf shape. It has a single entire leaf um, and it's alternate branching. We also recognize the flower of the tulip tree um, this tree, again, is the wood that was used historically for the single-span wooden bridges due to the fact that they grew so straight, so tall, so quickly. Um, and the bark characteristics, again, can vary depending on uh, the age of the tree. 
the buds are considered naked and alternate. Some good, line, good online tree references for further study on uh, various tree identification characteristics. You can visit the National Arbor Day Foundation, and the National Arbor Day Foundation really focuses on a lot of tree-related uh, type of activities, and specifically, they try to push Tree City USA or planting specifically the right tree in the right place. Some of those factors we discussed earlier on with regards to the silver maple, that they can be impacted by the planting space or drainage or root restrictions and things of that nature. If you select the right tree for the right location, you're increasing the chances that that tree will survive and thrive. And right tree, right place is something that the National Arbor Day Foundation uh, helps work in conjunction with local municipalities that if they increase their urban forest or the trees that occur in, within city limits, that once they reach a certain status, they can become a Tree City USA and actually display uh, signage around the municipality indicating that they are in this uh, urban forest program through the National Arbor Day Foundation. Additionally, there's the Indiana Urban Forest Council in which you can find out all kinds of information on city street trees. And additionally, the Indiana Department of Natural Resources, either within their division of forestry for timber and forest products type of information. Um, there's even the community and urban forestry sector of the division of forestry, which focuses on urban, uh, urban street tree health and uh, Tree City USA programs. Further information includes forest and tree health publications through the USDA. There's also the USDA plants database. And for information on uh, perhaps backpack hiking or visiting a true uh, national forest, we visit the Hoosier National Forest for information on uh, forest structure as well. Educational programming resources for those of you who might be homeschoolers or just have an interested an interest in learning more about trees. There is Project Learning Tree with the DNR's Division of Forestry, and that works with teachers and schools throughout Indiana to learn more about trees and the benefits and how to properly care for them uh, for future generations. There is, to the Indiana Tree Stewards Program, which I don't have it listed here, but the Indiana Tree Stewards Program is a community a group that works with the DNR's Division of Forestry in their community and urban forestry sector to volunteer to help with city street trees and caring for them or planting them or pruning them. There's also Indiana Expeditions Forests at Work that's a conjunctive effort between PBS, WY, WFYI, and the DNR. Uh, these DVDs talk about how forests work for us and what we can do to help them. Hardback identification keys that we do have here at the Crawfordsville District Public Library include 101 Trees of Indiana, a field guide by Indiana's own Marion T. Jackson. This is a most excellent guide that I would recommend. These other uh, three books are also great references. Trees of Indiana by uh, Charles C. Deem, also Indiana's own and 50 Trees of Indiana, and finally, Trees of Indiana, a field guide by Stan Tekela. We can all take advice from a tree. Stand tall and proud, sink your roots into the earth, be content with your natural beauty, go out on a limb, be sure to drink plenty of water, remember your roots, and always enjoy the view. For questions or comments, please feel free to email ask at cdpl.lib in.us. If you have any further questions after the, the completion of today's program, uh, please feel free to email that address again, ask at cdpl.lib.in.us, and put your questions to the attention of Stephanie. If you have uh, further topics that you might be interested in, please feel free to also send those. Thank you for attending Tree ID 101. I hope you have enjoyed this program as much as I have, and I look forward to giving Tree ID 102 or Winter Weather ID later this fall.
again, thank you. And I look forward to the next session.